Thank you so much for being with us this morning on The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. We're looking at a second conversation, and that's a national concern uh, following the flooding situation in Kogi State. Now, the reason for this, we know that flooding is a national issue, but the fact that there's a connection, Kogi State is a link between the north and the southern part of the country. Now, thousands of travelers and residents of Lokoja, Kogi State capital, are currently stranded as the city has been overrun by heavy flooding. The Lokoja Abuja Road, which connects the north and the south, has practically been cut off and thereby paralyzed in economic activities, including food supply chain from the north to the south, and vice versa. Widespread of Kogi State are underwater after the Niger and Benue River broke their banks, and Lokoja seats are the confluence of the Niger and Benue Rivers. Roughly 196 kilometers highway is one of the most critical roads in the country, being the major link between the north and the south for the movement of people, goods, and uh, through vehicular transportation. This comes amidst flooding in all the parts of Kogi State and in Nigeria. Generally, we have joining us now to make sense of this critical situation, uh, Professor Joe Ebigwai. Uh, who is an environmentalist. Thank you so much, Joy Bigwai, for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. My pleasure to be with you. So quickly, I'd like to share your thoughts on the development. I mean, looking at the flooding situation, uh, the banks have been broken. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I stayed in Lokojar in 1997, and um, I'm well familiar with the environment. And then I think I was staying at Dankolo. And that is the area that housed uh, Niwa, Nigeria Inland Waterways Authority. If, when we talk about uh, generally, there are several coastal factors. And uh, some of them, massive rainfall, overflow of the river, climate change, deforestation, the effect of snow, dam failure, uh, building on flood plains, inadequate uh, maintenance of drainage channels, waste dumping, and weak enforcement of regulations. These are some of the causal factors of flooding. But nonetheless, in Nigeria and in Kogi State in particular, what we've been witnessing are a combination of factors. One, massive rainfall. Two, overflow of the river bank. Three, climate change. Um, four, Building on flood plains. Five, inadequate maintenance of drainage channels. Six, waste dumping. And seven, weak enforcement of environmental policies and regulations. These are the seven factors that are playing out in the Kogi flooding as of today. So, but um, for this particular situation, I mean, the reason for all of this, unfortunately, we're unable to have the commissioner uh, in Lokoja for environment really to talk about this, right? Uh, he actually was unable to connect with us. I'm sure we would probably understand. But it's been reported that, you know, Lokoja is a confluence of the Niger and Benue River. And so it's more like an outflow. And that's what it is. But I'd like to find out from you, do you think that anything would have been done? Because prior to, you know, 2022, there were predictions that, uh, you know, states, some states should brace up for uh, the heavy downpour. Yeah, certainly, uh, because we normally have a lot of warnings from NIMEN, even at the beginning of each year, and they indicated some states that are prone to flooding. Now, when we look at the mitigation measures that uh, the state government would have uh, put in place, one, that is the enforcement of regulation. We have town planning laws. When you get to a local as it, and towards Ganaja. Ganaja is the area you have the confluence proper. You know, when you are coming from Ajaokuta to Lokoja itself. Now, you see some little settlements at the floodplains. Floodplains are where the water empties into. When you build shanties, when you decide to drill, uh, to put uh, something like hydrological channels, something like irrigation, you know, what you have just done, you may have bypass, you may have um, obstructed, altered the hydrological pathway, 
water will definitely flow from a region of high concentration from a high to a lower high. So when you now drill, because you, uh, you, you now alter the channel because you want to do irrigation, or you build a shanty there, you may be building on hydrological channels. And those are some of the cultural factors in that local jar area. So there are weak impacts, there are weak in enforcement of uh, environmental policies, town planning laws. So those are some of the cultural factors. I expected the government of this state to have acted proactively by um, enforcing the regulations, making sure that there are no arbitrary opening of hydrological channels for whatever cost, including irrigation. No building of a shanty on the floodplain. If they have done this too, and also mitigating the effect of waste dumping. You see, when you go over there, you see people just dumping waste on the river as if the river is an endless reservoir. The water isn't an endless reservoir. It will certainly get to a stage whereby it's carrying capacity will be, will be, will, 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 will be reached. And when the carrying capacity is reached, all what it does is that it overflows in bank. These are some of the mitigation measures I expected the Kogi State government to have put in place at the ministry. But with all of this, I mean, some persons have actually stated that, you know, it should be the time where uh, an emergency, a state of emergency should have been declared, especially uh, when it's been considered as a crisis. There's a disconnect. Already we have, uh, you know, some quarters saying that we're unable to meet certain criteria because we can't have the movement of goods from a certain region to another. So there's a disconnect between, uh, you know, the north and the south and part of the country. Do you think that, you know, there should be a declaration of a state of emergency? Um, well, I do not think uh, it has gotten to that point because I think it's still with, uh, with a still which date. Yes, it's a route for, for the transport, the hauling of um, goods between the north and the south. But you will agree with me that, that it is not only the route. Like, for example, you can take, uh, you can take from uh, the north now to Pepe, to your water bridge, and you are in uh, Benue, and then to Enugu, and you are down to the south. So there are other uh, transport corridors, but nonetheless, we should look at this corridor because if we took the Abuja, the Lokoja, and uh, some part of the ocean land into the Western Corridor, there's a food, there's a food uh, movement over there. If we don't want to take through the Ibadan, uh, Gomosho, uh, Niger State Agreed. But this area needs to be fixed. Why? Because it has an impact on seeing the road itself. They are constructing the road, and when you keep having a lot of flaws on the road, it tends to dead and limit the integrity of the roads. And these are some critical elements we have to look at because if we are doing roads and we are allowing floods to, over, to overflow the roads, what it means is that sooner and later the integrity, there will be failures on some sections of the road. And it will equally require money to fix it. So it is better what we need to do now as a state and as a nation is to look at those people living on the flood plain. So as, as quick as possible, relocate them to higher ground, then restore the hydrological channels as it was, and before you know, it will be mitigated. So, but a lot of people are saying that, you know, this is a trickle-down effect from Niger Republic, and of course, uh, Niger uh, is taking, you know, what it is, so it's an overflow what, what do you think that could have been done, you know, in, in that respect, that this is actually coming from an external environment, you know, to our country? Well, you see, uh, we have a weak uh, management of, um, weak enforcement of uh, policy, not only environmental policies and laws. Generally, in Nigeria, we don't take the Nigerian business as our business. We take it as general government business, you know, on timing. You see, and when we keep treating environmental issues with levity, it has a way of bouncing back to affect us. In fact, because the environmental impacts are so intangible, we don't feel it, it's not visible, 
we tend to neglect it, but it causes more insidious damage to our life. So, yes, what is playing out in the Kogi flooding is a microcosm. It's an after effect of the general malaise that is uh, befalling the Nigerian state as a nation. I agree. Well, so as a mid, first of all, we also have reports. Uh, if, if you look at the measures that have been taken, uh, there's provision for international canoe or canoes. I mean, I don't know how to say that. But um, that's been made. So you have, uh, uh, this means it's been put out for people to move from one point to the other. I'd like you to access the response, you know, from the government at the state and at the, you know, federal level. Do you think that this response is efficient to the issue that's on ground? Yes, providing, uh, providing um, means of um, transporting the impacted persons and impacted communities from the floodplain or from one point to the higher ground is a welcome development. These are some emergency relief mechanisms and strategies that are usually put in place when such, uh, when such occurs. But nonetheless, it is like treating the symptoms and leaving the disease. The disease is that there are causal factors responsible for the flooding. We need to talk to them. We need to speak. Our actions need to speak to those uh, causal factors. Why we do this? So, Moving people from one point to another to avoid the problem is a way out, but it must be tre treated holistically. While we are doing this, we must be tackling the causal factors of the flood, and that is where the real issue. What about uh, Professor Joseph? This is more like if you if you look at the pictures that we have in front of us, uh, in front of us, these houses have been submerged. I mean, so it means that lives and properties are threatened. It's a, it's, it's a situation of life and death. And uh, we're talking about the security or the response time and, you know, response measure of the government, whether at the federal, because you're saying that, oh, it hasn't gotten to a point where we should declare an emergency. But that really looks, you know, very saddening. Houses are, you know, overtaken by the flood. It's not just a one situation. Look at that. It's really saddening. And so one would think that at this point that the federal government, there should be a state of emergency that's been declared. And we should up our game in, tempo, in terms of, you know, uh, ensuring that there are rescue measures to take out people from there. So having to send boats or canoe, you know, the way we would actually put it, does that really address the yeah. situation? Do you think that we're able to, yeah. you know, save as much lives as we can with, you know, that means? Because... People have been displaced from what we're seeing. When, when you talk about state of emergency, I, I, what do you exactly mean? Because to, to me, when you declare a state of emergency, is to deploy all resources, financial and human resources, within your disposal to address a particular solid and episodic uh, events. Now, when we do that, if we declare an emergency now, you now declare, okay, uh, the Ministry of Environment, uh, the next rapports, all this, you just go there and say, what you're still going to do is to put people together so that they harmonize, uh, they, they harmonize all efforts meant at salvaging the situation. That is exactly what they should do with us. Let's say that a state of emergency is what is declared. All you need to do is to give a marching order to the people, to the offices, to the agencies involved in environmental issues, whether from town planning to the means of environment. You know, you have to work in a loop to addressing the situation, not just saying that we declare state of emergency. No, you don't need that word is so heavy. Sometimes we just use it for just a, a using state. When you say declare state of emergency, it means that. So in, in extreme case, you are removing the state government. You are removing all apparatus of government in that state and replacing it with a federal one. Does not really call for that, no? No. Can't the people 
far they in Kogi State arrest this situation, yes, they can. So all you need to do is for the government at the center to give them a matching order to bring this uh, uh, this malady to to a halt. So, I mean, we're still still concerned because to address a certain issue, you need to understand what you know the issue is. So when we begin to have cases where helicopters are being sent to rescue people, is it the case of having helicopters? Where would there be landing is the issue. We're talking about flood and the fact that, uh, you know, the dam has actually been over flooded and there's a break right now. And then you're having to send helicopters. Should, do we really know what exactly we're dealing with? Are we really paying attention? As much as we're saying it's not the entire country, the, the entire nation, we're talking about 36, including the FCT, but we're saying it's one part. And we see the, you know, the importance of, uh, you know, this part of the country because of the link or the connection that it has to other parts of the country. My question still remains, are we really, really, do we really understand what we're faced with? And are we taking the appropriate action as a people, as a government, in terms of response to this crisis? Yeah, well, it should be. Um, what we are just doing, as I said earlier, is treating the symptoms now. And, but the greater problem is treating the disease. If somebody is sick of HIV, you start giving the person a boobing, the person will not get well. It will only be a temporary relief, but not until you have had the HIV from his blood system, from his system before you can say that you have cured it. So what we are doing is like uh, a cosmetic thing now, which is necessary. We need to move people from the flood, start, uh, save their lives to higher grounds. But the main question is, how do we mitigate this in the future? Because if we don't mitigate it now, it will occur in another state. It will occur even in Kogi next year. So we should have a long-term plan and a short-term plan. The short-term plan now is to move people to higher grounds to save lives and property. But there should be a, a focus and a systemic um, um, plan in place to mitigate such in other states and in this state in future. And what is this? We look at what is, why is the dam overflowing. We look at the causal factors of the overflow of the dam. We equally look at what are the other factors that have um, that have um, uh, made flooding a recurring decimal in this area over the years, which includes waste uh, waste dumping, people building on flooding. Uh, Professor people Joseph, a big why? Professor Joseph, yeah. I mean, this is a long term. We understand that that should be what we should look at. We're talking about. Uh, immediately now, we have to we have to use, if possible, use a helicopter to pick people out immediately. That is one of the rescue missions we should be doing right now. Then we look at it. Is it possible? We, we look at where the dam, the, the, the where the dam failed. We look at it whether we can drill, we can put channels from there to drill into the larger water body away from. Um, to follow the ideological pathway. That is one critical thing we need to do now. Why evacuating people, look at the point at which the dam failed, then see what can be done to channel water to another point that does not have humans in that area. So, but in all of this, uh, we've had several reports about fuel scarcity in Abuja. And we also hear that because of this, uh, movement of goods and services have actually been uh, a big issue. And so you have those who are moving with the product to another part of the country. What should we expect, you know, the entire implication of all of this for the economy? Oh, it's a, the, the economy is already stressed. And so um, what, what is happening now is, is unfortunate and it's going to put more stress on the, on the ordinary citizen because um, we're not going to have some areas and going to be cut off from a supply of PMS and DPK as the case may be. And if that happens, you will see rights, you will see scarcity in some parts of the country. And if there are scarcity, and you know what it means, that means to say people will start buying, instead of buying 12 for about 200 or 180 or so, as the case may be, they may start resorting to buying around 400. And what that will also create some other issues. People will start adulterating the products. And if you put the adulterated product in your in your car or your generator or whatever, it will lead to some other effects. 
and all this will amount to removing the money that is, that is inadequate from your pocket. So it will further uh, raise the poverty levels in the economy, and that is a minus for the government. Well, thank you so much, Professor Joseph Ebigwai, uh, for being part of the show this morning and sharing your thoughts. Our prayers and our heart is with Kogi State. Thank you very much. God bless you. Well, Professor Joseph Ebigwai is a, an environmentalist and he reached us all the way from uh, Cross River State, Calabar. Well, that's the size of a conversation this morning. If you missed out on any part of it, it will be great to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's at Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. On Limex, it's at www.limex.tv and Glow TV apps anywhere in the world. My name is Messi Boko. Have a great Friday.